What the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at Noah More Parties. And it's been a while. Uh, took a trip to the Big Apple for the NFL draft. That came and went. We got landing spots. We got draft capital for all these guys. Today's video is my post-draft rookie running back rankings. And I don't know if you can hear that. Uh, today is, and right now, is the only time I have to, uh, to film. Somebody's running a wood chipper. Hopefully that's not loud. But we're gonna do what we do what we can, run through these rookies. I know a lot of people got their, you know, their their top five rookie running back rankings, top ten rookie running back rankings, even top twenty rookie running back rankings. Not here. We have thirty nine running backs ranked. We're gonna run through all of them, have them in sort of like tiers, ranked within the tiers. So yeah, let's get into it. <laughs> Number one, uh, this tier is guys that I'm not really interested in at all. Most of them are UDFAs. One of them was a day three pick, um, and that is starting at RB39, Greg Bell um, with the Lions, CJ Verdell with the Colts, Jay Sean Corbin with the Giants, Raheem Blackshear with Buffalo, who's actually a guy who I kind of liked as a satellite back um, coming into the draft. He ended up in a spot where they already have like Devin Singletary, Zach Moss, Duke Johnson. Uh, they drafted James Cook, and so his value was as like a smaller running back who catches passes and they already have like at least two guys there who are better at that than him. So liked him as a player, don't see much opportunity for him in Buffalo. And then Master Teague with Chicago and Tristan Ebner with uh, Chicago as well, who's another pass catching back that I just don't think is really that good. This next tier guys is the vaguely interesting tier. These guys are all undrafted free agents and it starts at RB33 with Ronnie Rivers who ended up with the Cardinals and they got a couple other guys there too like Jonathan Ward is another um he's not really a satellite back but he's a smaller guy. They have Eno Benjamin who I think is a decent player. Ronnie Rivers I think is a decent player. Not sure what kind of shot he has there but he's at least vaguely interesting. Um Devonte Price with the Colts I think the Colts' depth chart is fairly weak beyond uh, Jonathan Taylor, obviously, the Naeem Hines at satellite back, and then they have Deion Jackson, um, who's their kind of their third running back, and that's really all they have. Deion Jackson isn't really much of a guy at all, and so the Colts signed a few undrafted free agents. I mentioned C.J. Verdell, Devontae Price. I'll mention Max Borgie in a second, and so these guys who are like the best of the of the undrafted free agents they signed could have a chance to at least like make the roster be the third guy there if Jonathan Taylor gets hurt it's Naeem Hines and nobody else so like these guys have an opportunity to step into volume on what should be a decent team so Devontae Price with the Colts is my RB32 and then Jerry and Ely in Kansas City you know they got pass catchers there too I think he's at least a talented dude um, Max Borgie who I just mentioned with the Colts I think he's just better than Devontae Price um, he's another like satellite back type dude but he's almost 210 pounds and so he could conceivably step into a little bit of a role if Jonathan Taylor got hurt, assuming Borgie makes the team. A lot of assumptions we got to make here for these guys, but I think Borgie like is hypothetically talented and there's opportunity here. So my RB29 is Tyler Goodson, who ended up with the Packers. And, you know, we got Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon there. But beyond that, they don't really have guys who like fill roles. They've got Kylan Hill is on the team, who's just like a complete jag. And then beyond that, I don't even know if they have another running back on the team. But uh, Tyler Goodson was a good player at Iowa. Um, pass catching back, kind of miscast as like a three down player there. But yeah, I think he's a fun player. We've seen Matt LaFleur do things with like Tyler Irvin um, and some of these other like jet sweep type guys before. And so, you know, I, I think the odds of Tyler Goodson at least making the team in Green Bay are decent. Um, and then my RB28 is Jalen Warren, who signed with Pittsburgh after the draft. And this is really just like a potential handcuff play for Najee Harris because I think Anthony McFarland sucks. I think Benny Snell sucks. I'm not sure like Jalen Samuels is gone. He's not there anymore. Do they still have Kalen Balazs? I, like they just don't have much beyond Najee Harris. Like they have one of the weakest depth charts beyond Harris in the league. And so Jalen Warren was a really productive guy for Oklahoma State. Um, efficient runner, solid dude. The odds that he's better than Benny Snell and Anthony McFarland are at least greater than zero. And so given that there's nobody else in that team, he has to be at least interesting. And then this next tier is a couple of guys who ended up getting drafted. Because they got drafted, I'm contractually obligated to rank them higher than most undrafted free agents. Even though I don't like these guys that much, I'm not a huge fan of their landing spots. They didn't get great capital. And starting there um, at RB27, I have Tyler Beatty, who ended up with the Ravens. And I've seen some people like excited about this. Um, I saw a Twitter poll of like Keonta Ingram or Tyler Beatty. Somebody tagged me in this. And I think Keonta Ingram ended up winning, but it was like 55-45 or something. And I cannot fathom that. Tyler Beatty is a satellite back 
who ended up on a team that has Justice Hill, who I think is a worse receiver than Tyler Beatty, but like we ran this back a couple years ago with an athletic, small guy who catches some passes playing in an offense with Lamar Jackson. Like they just don't target their running backs. I think the running back target share in Baltimore last season was the lowest in the league. J.K. Dobbins is good at that. Like what, what role could Tyler Beatty possibly play here? I don't really get it. He's my RB. Uh, he was my RB 23 pre-draft. The landing spot wasn't great. Yeah, I'm just not super excited about Tyler Beatty. Um, my RB 26 is Ty Chandler, who ended up in Minnesota. Um, and that's obviously a stacked depth chart as well. Dalvin Cook is, you know, just a three down um, workhorse at the top. He ends up getting hurt, uh, you know, a couple times a year. Alexander Madison is able to step in. They got Kenny Nwongwu. Some dude named AJ Rose is also um, under contract at running back. Ty Chandler is fine. I think he's kind of like the new Mike Boone here. An athletic, like, straight-line speed dude who can catch passes, but there's just not a whole lot of, like, playing time to go around in this offense, and I, yeah, I just don't think there's any chance that, like, he's ever the starter, ever even the second guy. Like, I don't know why he would get run over the, you know, the three guys, that the, you know, ahead of him on the depth chart. My RB25 is Isaiah Pacheco, who ended up in Kansas City in the seventh round, and, you know, a lot of people like him, like, he's a speed score guy, he was, you know, decently efficient in a terrible offense at Rutgers, but he doesn't catch passes, they got guys who, like, fill roles there, like, Ronald Jones is a good two-down runner, Clyde Edwards-Hilaire is hypothetically a good pass catcher, but that's not what Pacheco does anyway, so it's like, he's not going to step into that role in place of um, CEH. And then they got Brendan Knox and Derek Gore also on the team who are just kind of dudes. Like Pacheco could end up being the third running back and I would probably predict that, but I don't think that's worth much given that like the things that you want NFL running backs to do are already covered by the two guys ahead of him. Like he's, he could step in in, in case of an injury, but like he's just a random dude in a situation where he could play when someone's hurt. Like that's not, I don't know. I'm not that interested. And then this next tier is UDFAs that I like. RB24 is Letty Brown with the LA Chargers. Um, he was my RB12 pre-draft, super boring dude, but super solid dude. And there's not a whole lot of opportunity to go around in the Chargers backfield either. Like Austin Eckler is capable of playing on all three downs. Like we've seen that for multiple years now. Super dynamic, like out in space. They drafted Isaiah Spiller, who's presumably going to be like you know, kind of the, the the bigger dude to Austin Eckler's kind of, I don't know, like a thunder and lightning type duo there. And then they got like Joshua Kelly, Larry Roundtree, who were just kind of jags. Kevin Marks, Xander Horvath was another UDFA they signed. I think Letty Brown is just a guy that I like who's in a good offense. And I think the odds that he's just better than like Joshua Kelly and Larry Roundtree are decent. And so while I don't think he's like that good, those guys aren't that good either. So the odds of him making the team and then being able to play with an injury to either like Spiller or Eckler seems decent to me. And then my RB23 is Bryant Kobach, who ended up in Minnesota. Kind of the situational takes for him are basically the same as for Ty Chandler. They ended up on the same team, but I just think Kobach is better. Like he's a bigger dude. He catches passes as well. He, I think he's a pretty raw runner, but he was like super dynamic out in space in college. Kenny Nwongwu was kind of on the team for the same reasons that Kobach is, similar players. Kobach was just a way better college player than Duangwu was. And so I think Kobach, you know, could stick around, be the RB3 on this team. Maybe he's more dynamic than Madison and could be the RB2. Like, it's obviously a long shot, but I like Kobach's talent and the way that, you know, the guys in front of him on this depth chart are similar enough to him that he could prove to just be better than them. Um, my RB22 is Zonovan Knight, who ended up with the Jets. Um, he's kind of a fun player, um, really good on the ground, just like pure runner. Also has some pass catching ability. Brees Hall obviously is here now, and he's going to be like the, you know, the, the RB1 workhorse. And then they got like Michael Carter, Tevin Coleman, the Michael P. Ryan, Ty Johnson are the main guys behind him. Zonovan Knight, I think, is a Tevin Coleman type dude who's just better than Tevin Coleman at this point in their careers. And so Zonovan Knight could stick around, be the RB3 here. I don't know if I would predict that, but I think there's enough of a chance that like I'm at least interested in him like after rookie drafts. So this next tier is another tier um, of guys who went drafted who probably have a little bit more opportunity. And I am once again contractually obligated to rank them higher than some of the UDFAs that I just mentioned. So um, my RB21 is Kyron Williams. This was a kind of a weird selection by the Rams, I thought, because Daryl Henderson is good. Um, I guess he's not like a pure satellite back, and so I guess that would be what they're looking for here. But Cam Akers can also contribute on all three downs. I just don't see a ton of playing time for Kyron Williams here. You know, they got a they got a satellite back in like Raymond Calais, JV and Hawkins is another small dude. I think Kyron Williams is the purest and best pass catching running back on this team, but 
Cam Akers and Daryl Henderson is a pretty good one-two duo, and I don't see Kyron Williams, like, you know, he might get on the field a little bit. It's kind of it's kind of a Tyler Goodson situation with, like, Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon. Kyron Williams is just higher here because he got drafted and presumably will have more of a chance. So, Jerome Ford is my RB20. He ended up in Cleveland, and that's a stacked depth chart there at running back. Nick Chubb, Kareem Hunt for the time being, at least. Dearness Johnson is another guy I like. Jerome Ford is a good straight-line runner. I think he's kind of a Tevin Coleman-type dude as well, kind of a Chuba Hubbard type guy. He can catch passes a little bit. Would not be surprised to see them cut Kareem Hunt and then it's like Chubb and then Johnson and Ford behind Chubb. And that would be, you know, probably not a fantasy relevant role unless Chubb gets hurt. But I think Jerome Ford is a good player who ended up on a good team in a place where like there's not an, op- an opportunity right now, but it could open up. And then my next tier is UDFAs, who I think are like legitimately good and ended up on ascendable depth charts, plus some guys who like got draft capital and might have some potential opportunity through that. And the first guy in that tier is my RB19. It's Kennedy Brooks, who ended up in Philadelphia. And they have like Miles Sanders, Kenneth Gainwell, and Boston Scott, who I think are all decent players. Um, Sanders has kind of been miscast as a lead running back. He's just sort of a like... I don't know, space back, not great between the tackles, not a great receiver. He's just kind of blah as a lead runner. Gainwell and Boston Scott are both good receivers. There's a hole in this offense where like Jay Ajayi, LeGarrette Blunt, Jordan Howard used to fill of like a two down runner who's like legitimately good between the tackles. And that's Kennedy Brooks. He's one of the best pure runners in this class, not a ton of size. He doesn't catch passes, but that's a role that Philadelphia has had in their offense for the last like five years. They don't currently have a guy who does that. Kennedy Brooks can do that well. And so I think I'm pretty interested in him. Abram Smith is my RB18. He ended up in New Orleans. And this is another depth chart where there's like, you know, there's Alvin Kamara at the top. Nobody's going to, you know, beat him out. We've got an aging Mark Ingram behind him. We've got guys like Dwayne Washington and Josh Adams, uh, Tony Jones, who are kind of just like jaggy talents. Abram Smith was really good at Baylor last year. He's got history of like playing defense, you know, experience on special teams that could give him, you know, value over a Josh Adams, over a Tony Jones and like final cuts and stuff where then, you know, maybe he's good enough on the ground that he, you know, takes some touches away from Mark Ingram. Maybe Ingram goes down and Abram Smith just steps into the number two role behind Alvin Kamara. I think the odds of that happening maybe aren't likely, but they're at least probable enough that it's worth taking shots on Abram Smith on your taxi squad after a rookie draft. My RB17 is Snoop Connor, who actually got drafted in the fifth round to Jacksonville. And the reason he's interesting is I don't think he's a great player. I think he's like just a total jag runner, not a great pass catcher. Um, He actually, you know, doesn't have a problem like catching the ball. I just don't think he's like a super like advanced or skilled receiver, but he's a two down grinder, pretty jaggy guy. But the reasons that I was interested in Raquel Armstead earlier this offseason are the same reasons that you have to be interested in Snoop Connor. Like James Robinson is coming off an Achilles injury and Achilles, I think it was an Achilles and might not be ready by week one, might just be like done. ETN himself is coming off an injury and I'm optimistic about him, but I think behind ETN, it's Robinson, who is very fragile at this point. Then it's Armstead, who I think is better than Connor, but like they're similar style players. And it, you know, easily the Jaguar, you know, coaches could defer to Connor since, you know, it's a, it's a new coaching staff. He's their guy. Raquel Armstead's just kind of left over from the previous regime or like two regimes ago, actually. Snoop Connor could be the number two guy behind Travis ETN. Could be a handcuff. He'd be one of the most boring handcuffs in the league, but he'd be a handcuff nonetheless. And so you got to be interested in Snoop Connor. My RB16 is Zaquandre White, who signed as an undrafted free agent with Miami, and they just have like a kind of a random collection of dudes filling roles at running back right now, and there's opportunity for somebody who's talented to step in and snatch like one or multiple roles. And so they got like Chase Edmonds, who's a good player, uh, Raheem Mostert, Miles Gaskin, Salvin Ahmed, Patrick Laird, uh, Lynn Bowden, Jared Dokes. These guys, most of them... Literally every single one of these guys, other than Jared Dokes, who sucks, all these guys are small. Zaquandre White is 215 pounds. He's a decent pass catcher. He was a really efficient runner on limited work in college. Super productive at junior college. Like, I'm not predicting this, but it would not shock me if Zaquandre White's just the best player in this backfield. I think he's better than Miles Gaskin. Raheem Mostert fits what San Francisco, or Miami, but this is the San Francisco system, what they like to do at running back. And so... You know, he's going to have a role. Chase Edmonds is obviously going to have a role. He's a good player. I think Saquandre White could make this team and end up getting playing time. I I really like this landing spot for him because there's just not a ton of like super, super strong players ahead of him. Uh, My RB15 is Pierre Strong, who ended up in New England, taken in the fourth round. He's like a super dynamic guy um, out in space. He catches the ball a little bit. He's really fast. And the New England depth chart is like 
a little tougher to ascend than the Miami depth chart, but it's similar. They got Damian Harris, Ramondre Stevenson, uh, James White, J.J. Taylor, these guys who like fill roles but aren't like elite players. These are all like average, slightly above average dudes. Pierre Strong, like there's a hole there if James White is kind of over the hill, J.J. Taylor isn't quite what they wanted, you know, you know, what they wanted him to be in replacing James White. Pierre Strong could step in, be their pass catching back, could be like a Tevin Coleman type dude who is dynamic in a straight line, um, can catch a swing pass and take it 15 yards while making somebody miss. He just has an element to his game that they don't have in this backfield. And so I think there's opportunity for him here. This next year of guys is the guys who have the highest upside, I think, beyond the players with like visible immediate opportunity. And so these are guys who like might not play immediately, might not ever get a ton of playing time. But if they do, if they are able to seize that opportunity, I think they're really good players who could be productive in fantasy. And my RB14 is Julius Chestnut, ended up with the Titans as an undrafted free agent. And they got Derrick Henry there. And beyond him, there's not much. They got Hassan Haskins, who they just drafted, who I'll talk about in a little bit. I also like him. They've got Dontrell Hilliard, who's like a a third down guy, um, space back, who I think is good but he serves a different role that, than Chestnut does. And then guys like Jordan Wilkins and Trenton Cannon behind them, who are just sort of average. Julius Chestnut is big, fast, was super efficient, and super productive at the FCS level in college. It might come down to him and Haskins in like winning this number two job. And while you got to defer to Haskins because he got the draft capital, Julius Chestnut is really talented. And given that Derrick Henry's like getting older, um, just came off his least healthy season of his career, the least effective season of his career, you have to be interested in talented players players at the end of this depth chart with a chance to ascend past the Jags ahead of them. That's Julius Chestnut. My RB13 is Kevin Harris, who also ended up in New England. Um, he was my RB5 pre-draft. I think he's a really good two-down runner. You know, pleasantly surprised that he ended up getting drafted. I guess not surprised, but it, it was a good sign that he got drafted because, you know, the way that the medicals were going to check out, you know, he had this back injury and a surgery. It's good that somebody looked at him and was like, yes, he's worth drafting. Um, it wasn't a Justin Ross situation where they're just like, fuck, this guy's done. And so Kevin Harris is a similar player to like Damian Harris and Ramondre Stevenson. I just think in a vacuum, he's better than them. I think he, you know, he was more productive in college than both of those guys were. He was a really good lead back, really efficient lead back when he was healthy in 2020 in the SEC. I'm not saying he's going to like, you know, supplant Damian Harris or Ramondre Stevenson, but I think there's a chance that happens. And I don't know if New England will ever just go to like one single lead back to, you know, be the, be the lead guy in this offense. But Kevin Harris, for my money, is the most talented running back in this backfield. Whether that comes to fruition is a different question, but I think this isn't a super strong depth chart. You know, there's no, there's no Dalvin Cook here. And so if this is a meritocracy and if I'm right about Kevin Harris's talent level and if he's healthy, that's a lot of ifs, but there's upside there. This next tier, guys, is a big, dumb tier of mostly blah players who got drafted and ended up in decent spots. And the first one of those at RB12 is Brian Robinson in Washington. You know, he's on a team with Antonio Gibson uh, as a lead back. J.D. McKissick's going to play a role. I think Brian Robinson slots in as like the the between-the-tackles grinder. J.D. McKissick's going to be the pass-catching back. Antonio Gibson will be able to like live up to his strengths as kind of like a space back who, you know, has some size. And this will be like a, this will be a three-headed monster, man. So I'm not super excited about Brian Robinson in fantasy, but like with an injury to Antonio Gibson, he could be an RB2. So you got to at least be interested. He's a jag with a full skill set. And, you know, that that means that he could fill a lot of different roles, whether there's injuries or, you know, Antonio Gibson plays poorly or, you know, whatever it is, there's opportunity here for a guy with a full skill set. Brian Robinson isn't that good, but he has a full skill set. My RB11 is Hassan Haskins, who I mentioned earlier in talking about Chestnut. And the case for him is basically the same as for Chestnut. Like, this isn't a strong depth chart. Derrick Henry is probably a fairly fragile Um, lead back at this point in his career. And Hassan Haskins was, you know, he's a big dude who was a really efficient lead back at Michigan. I think he's a good player, two down grinder who could step into volume. Like we saw Deontay Foreman be decent um, with the Titans last year. Hassan Haskins could be that dude. My RB10 is Tyrion Davis-Price, who ended up in San Francisco. I think San Francisco probably defers to Elijah Mitchell, um, at least early on in year one. I don't think Elijah Mitchell is that good. I don't know that Ty Davis Price is that good either, but I think he's a solid dude. He's got decent size. He's got decent speed. I know there's, you know, film grinders who love his pass blocking ability. He was an efficient runner at LSU. 
I think he's just a good player, and with third-round capital on a team that just churns through running backs, you have to at least be interested in taking a shot on Ty Davis' price. My RB9 is Isaiah Spiller, who I don't think is that good, but he ended up in a really nice spot um, with the Chargers. Austin Eckler's the lead guy there. I think Isaiah Spiller steps right into a role as the number two running back and can handle, you know, like short yardage. He can also catch passes, you know, do a little a little of the, you know, between the tackles work. He can be the grinder back on this offense, on a really good offense. And, you know, probably hurts Austin Eckler's upside a little bit. While I don't think Isaiah Spiller is definitely better than Joshua Kelly, I think the Chargers probably think he's definitely better than Joshua Kelly. And so I'm viewing this as if like Wayne Gallman got fourth round draft cap to go play with the Chargers as a 21-year-old rookie. Like, yeah, he's probably going to be the, you know, get some volume as the second guy in this offense. I just don't think there's... I'm not super excited unless Austin Eckler gets hurt. In which case, Isaiah Spiller's probably an RB1 in fantasy just off of volume alone. He also has a full skill set, except for being like an inefficient runner, but he's like big and can catch passes. He's in a situation where he can provide value to a fantasy team, given the situation on this roster, given the draft capital they spent. Um, you know, he didn't fall the sixth round. I think they actually think he's good. So you got to be interested there. My RB8 is Zamir White, who ended up um, with the Raiders. Josh Jacobs is going to be ahead of him. They got Kenyon Drake there to catch passes. I think Zamir White White at this point in his career probably is comparable to Josh Jacobs as a between the tackles runner, as a short yardage runner. He was really good there in college and he has the athletic upside that Jacobs doesn't have in like, you know, hypothetically being able to like produce big plays, rip off big runs. He didn't do that in college. I know that NFL personnel people think he's good at that. He's going to be part of a committee here and would be fine and, you know, has potential for more if somebody gets hurt or if, you know, Jacobs falls off a cliff or whatever. Zamir White got decent capital, is a good two down runner. That's about it. Um, this next tier is a single player tier called, I don't know, man. And that is James Cook. I can see both sides of the James Cook argument. I can see the side that says like, he's a super dynamic receiver, explosive runner in the open field, great offense, second round draft capital, like check, 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 check. The boxes are lining up for him to have a ton of opportunity here. And, you know, while he wasn't as productive as some of these guys in college, he has a comparable skill set to like a CJ Spiller, a Jamal Charles. And those are, you know, lofty comps to reach. But if anybody is shaped like those players, it's James Cook. And so I can see the upside here. I just think that they're just going to use him as a pass catching back who lines up in the slot sometimes. And that has value to an NFL team, but not so much to a fantasy team. I think, you know, the the pre-draft kind of projections of him being like a Chris Thompson type dude and Naeem Hines type dude in fantasy, I think those are still legitimate. And this is going to be a committee. Devin Singletary is going to be involved. Zach Moss is probably going to be involved. I don't know what happens to Duke Johnson. I think he's still a good player. James Cook is going to be involved as a pass catcher, but Josh Allen likes to run. I think this is a creative offense. I just don't know that there's like that much room for him to provide a lot of fantasy utility, given that I don't think their plan is to feature him as the lead back. So that's where I have James Cook right now. Um, I could easily see myself putting him higher or lower as I continue thinking about this. But right now, I think that kind of splits the difference pretty well on range of outcomes for James Cook. This next tier is the non-premier draft capital, but like a convergence of talent and opportunity. And the first guy in that tier is my RB6, and that's Tyler Algier, who ended up with the Falcons in the fifth round. And this is just a very ascendable depth chart. Like Cordero Patterson was their RB1 last year. He's not a pure running back. He was not very good on the ground last season. In an alternate reality where he enters the league in 2021, maybe he gets put in a Debo Samuel type role. He's a LaVisca Chenault type dude. I don't think he's a pure running back. And they had to use him that way last year. Um, but I think Algier is much more of like a pure two down runner. He was good there at BYU. He's got size. He's got okay athleticism. He can swing out and catch a pass just fine. I would not be surprised to see him be the lead back on this team. And, you know, we, we saw that with like Mike Davis last year where that was, you know, kind of the, the preseason expectation. Algier is better than Mike Davis. Um, he doesn't have quite the three down ability that Davis has, but he's a much better runner than Mike Davis is. Um, he's a more consistent player than Damian Williams. He's just a pure running back than Cordero Patterson. Would not shock me to see him just lead this backfield, and they probably won't be a very good team, won't be a very good offense, but having a decent runner who's leading an NFL backfield is worth something in fantasy. The next guy in this tier is my RB5, Keontae Ingram in Arizona, 
And I think he's the best player in this backfield. Like, he was taken in the sixth round. They got James Conner, who was effective last year in fantasy because he scored a ton of touchdowns, but he was one of the least efficient lead backs in the entire league last year. He's cooked from, like, a play-to-play effectiveness standpoint. He's just living off of volume right now. And then Eno Benjamin is a good satellite back, but... He hasn't really done anything in the NFL to this point. Who knows if the Cardinals will actually allow him to, you know, play, really. And then there's, like, Jalen Samuels and Jonathan Ward on this team who are just kind of random dudes. Keontae Ingram has the most complete skill set, the best mix of, like, size, athleticism, pass-catching ability, pure running ability of anybody on this team. Like, James Conner and Eno Benjamin combined for the skill set that Keontae Ingram has on his own. I don't know that I'm predicting him to like usurp James Conner at some point this season, but it would not shock me. I'm I'm excited about Keonta Ingram in Arizona. This next tier is good players with a decent mix of capital and opportunity. The first guy in that in that tier is my RB4, that's Rashad White, who ended up in Tampa Bay. And he obviously has Leonard Fournette ahead of him, who I think is still an effective player. I don't think he's like that good at this point in his career, but he's an above average running back with size, pass catching ability. Leonard Fournette is the RB1 in this offense, I would think. And there's like Keyshawn Vaughn, Giovanni. Bernard. Those guys are just kind of role players. I think Rashad White like combines them well, similar to how like Keontae Ingram does with James Conner and Eno Benjamin. Rashad White is Keyshawn Vaughn times Giovanni Bernard. He's got good size. He's a good pass catcher. He's athletic. I don't know that he's like a pure between the tackles runner with a lot of skill in that area, but he's dynamic out in space. He's at least like a Tony Pollard, Kenyon Drake type dude. And at his ceiling, he's a David Johnson, Alvin Kamara type player, at least in the role he's able to fill as like a non-traditional between the tackles running back with a full skill set. And so this is, this is honestly a pretty, you know, similar situation to the situations that like Alvin Kamara and David Johnson got drafted into, you know, Alvin Kamara had Mark Ingram ahead of him, who was a, you know, a decent running back, probably similar of similar quality to where Leonard Fournette is now. Adrian Peterson was there. Alvin Kamara ended up jumping him. I would assume Rashad White jumps Keyshawn Vaughn and plays in sort of like a, a, a 1B role to Leonard Fournette at some point this season. And then like David Johnson had uh, Chris Johnson ahead of him. Andre Ellington might have been on that team. And so there were these, you know, veteran running backs. And David Johnson took a while to kind of establish himself. He was playing good early on, returning kicks and stuff like that. And then by like week 12, he was the lead dude and was winning people leagues and, you know, winning people fantasy championships. I think Rashad White could do that. He could usurp Leonard Fournette by the time the season is over, just be like a younger dude with more juice who can play on all three downs. And in a Tom Brady-led offense with a lot of weapons, that could have a lot of value. He could be a league winner this year in fantasy football. My RB3 is Damian Pierce, who ended up in Houston in the fourth round. And I was really interested in Marlon Mack pre-draft because this, he, it looked like he was just the, you know, the highest upside guy, the most talented player in a wide open backfield, like a completely wide open depth chart here. Damian Pierce steps in and I think is better than Marlon Mack. He is a really good between the tackles runner. He doesn't have a lot of open field juice, but other than that, he's got a full skill set. He's one of the most dynamic receivers in this class. He's got workhorse size. He's got decent athleticism. He's a Defonte Freeman, Eddie Lacy, Mark Ingram type dude who can step in to an offense that's not going to be good, but is going to be you know, functional. Davis Mills was fine last year. Like he could be the undisputed lead back on an NFL team. And that has a lot of value in fantasy football, even if the team is bad. And so I'm really interested in Damian Pierce. I'm almost tempted to put him ahead of my RB2. I could see an argument for Rashad White at RB2 as well. But my RB2 right now is Kenneth Walker in Seattle. He's my RB2 pre-draft, taken with decent capital in the early mid first or early mid second round. And this has been an interesting one for me to think about because Seattle loves to run the ball. This was good capital. And Kenneth Walker is a great pure runner. Like that seems to like line up like bam, 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 like let's go. But A, This team is going to be bad. This offense is going to be bad. They have a backwards offensive philosophy. They want to run the ball, which is good for a guy that runs the ball, but it's bad for overall offensive efficiency. And Drew Locke is probably a bad quarterback. So... I, d- I don't view this offense as being very good, but even beyond that, like I'm, I'm interested in Damian Pierce, even though the offense is bad. I'm interested in Algier, even though the offense is bad. So that's that's not really the point, but it's it's part of the puzzle. Really, the point is that normally with like second round capital, we're like, okay, it's wheels up. Like this team invested heavily in this guy. 
they're going to let him lead their backfield. Seattle might be the only team where that doesn't seem like the case. You know, I, I, I listened to the, you know, the press conference where they're talking about they want to they wanna run a lot of guys at running back. They want a, a good mix of players in there to keep people healthy, to keep people fresh. And while I think Kenneth Walker is easily the best pure runner on this team, it's easily because he's so good. It's not easily because Rashad Penny is bad. Rashad Penny is really good, really dynamic in his own right. And he proved that in one of the only stretches of one of the only healthy stretches of his career at the end of last season, when he was arguably the best pure runner in the league for like five or six weeks. I'm not really worried about Chris Carson. I think he's probably not healthy, and I think Kenneth Walker just definitely has more juice than him at this point. And the other guys in the team, you know, Travis Homer, DJ Dallas, they're not much of a threat either. But I would not be shocked to see this be like a true 50-50 split between Walker and Rashad Penny. And the last time Seattle spent significant capital on a running back was with Rashad Penny, and they gave him a couple weeks is like the lead back, but he he had like 10 carries, seven carries those first couple games. Chris Carson outplayed him. And then Chris Carson was just the dude. Like they, they make some idiotic decisions with personnel and things like that in Seattle, but they run a meritocracy as far as who's getting playing time. And if I had to bet, I'd bet that Kenneth Walker plays better than Rashad Penny is and is the better player, but I'm not confident in whatever, you know, small sample they're going to give him before they make a decision at the beginning of the year. Like Rashad Penny got two weeks. If Kenneth Walker has a tough time acclimating in the first two or three weeks, am I confident that they're not just going to go with Rashad Penny? No, I'm not. Am I confident that even if Walker is really effective early on, that it's not just going to be a 50-50 split with him and Rashad Penny? No, I'm not. Like, there's so many different scenarios that could fall out here that don't result in Kenneth Walker just getting a ton of volume. That's kind of what he needed in order to be fantasy relevant, in order to be effective in fantasy, because, you know, the argument for him as a pass catcher was Michigan State just didn't throw to the running backs. Well, neither does Seattle. They were fourth lowest in the league last year in target share to running backs. And yeah, Russell Wilson is a running quarterback. They don't throw to running backs. He's gone. Now they have Drew Locke. But like, this is still an offensive philosophy that A, doesn't want to throw the ball much anyway. B, we haven't seen a sample of like Pete Carroll and his offensive coordinators without Russell Wilson for long stretches. Um, when he missed games last year, that target share was consistently low with running back still. It was still right around the 14% mark. Still would have been bottom five in the league when Russell Wilson missed time. And Drew Locke is going to step in and be the quarterback. And the stretch of play that we have as a sample for him is in 2020. He started 13 games for the Broncos. That season, Broncos running backs were targeted 12.9%. That was their target share, which would have been even lower than what Seahawks running backs had last season. So if your argument is that like Kenneth Walker has untapped three down potential, given that he wasn't playing on a team that threw to running backs in college, he's now on a team that's not going to tap into that potential in the NFL because Seattle doesn't throw to running backs either. So these, these positives that you could kind of, you know, convince yourself of with him as a prospect are, you know, he's big enough to get volume, hypothetically. He's good enough, hypothetically, to get receiving work. I don't know that either of those things come to fruition in Seattle. I think ideally Seattle sees this as, you know, we have two really good running backs in Penny and Walker and maybe another guy in Carson. I can see the outcome where Kenneth Walker just takes over this backfield and is a high volume runner on a bad team, which has some value in fantasy. But I think there are a lot of risks that we just never see him fully unlocked, at least in year one with Rashad Penny on the team. All that being said, the next tier is the 101. My RB1 is still Brees Hall. He ended up with the Jets, and there's just a lot, lot of opportunity to go around here. Like, Michael Carter is a good player, played well last season, is probably best deployed as, like, a Duke Johnson, Giovanni Bernard-type satellite back who can also do some things on first and second down. But Brees Hall is going to step into this offense and be the Ezekiel Elliott. He's going to be the Joe Mixon. Um, I see his opportunity share looking sort of like Joe Mixon's, where, you know, Joe Mixon is a better receiver than Brees Hall is, by far. You know, his his college profile showed that. He just doesn't quite get used there in the NFL. I think Brees Hall steps into an opportunity share into a role that is similar to what Joe Mixon has seen in the NFL. Like, Michael Carter will serve in the Giovanni Bernard role that Bernard had with Mixon in Cincinnati, where we're just like, fuck, man, like, why can't Mixon play on all three downs? Brees Hall is going to be a two-down player. He, you know, might catch like 40 passes. He's going to be an RB1 in fantasy, I would think. There's a chance that this offense really ascends if Zach Wilson is able to take that next step. They've surrounded him with a lot of talented skill position players that are conducive to him taking that next step. If he doesn't take the next step, Brees Hall is a workhorse running back on a bad team with a lot of talent. That has a lot of value. If Zach Wilson does take that next step, Brees Hall is a workhorse running back on a team with a good quarterback and a lot of skill position talent. That has a lot of value in fantasy. I think I'm still interested in trading out of the 101. You know, people think that Brees Hall is this like 
Jonathan Taylor level player. He's getting Herschel Walker comps and shit like that. I don't think he's quite that good. The flaws that I saw in him as a prospect are still there. And so I would be still open to pivoting out of the 101 for a package of, you know, ETN plus, Nick Chubb plus, a couple 2023 20, picks plus a solid player. Like, I'm still interested in that, but I think this is a good landing spot for Brees Hall. I'm confident he's going to be productive. He's just a good player who ended up in a good spot. So yeah, that'll, that'll wrap it up for my post-draft running back rankings go wild in your rookie drafts i'll probably have like more targeted videos for some of these players going forward probably a kenneth walker video maybe damien pierce and rashad white as well so some of these guys that i'm like a little bit more interested in or guys that i see being overdrafted i'll probably fire off some takes here in the next couple weeks but yeah thanks for sticking around let me know how dumb i am for i don't know none of these takes seem egregious to me so maybe i'm not dumb but let me know what you think in the comments smash those like and subscribe buttons catch me on twitter see you on sunday peace